Okay, hi, good evening. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, before I introduce some stuff, obviously, coronavirus is a big thing at the minute. Um, and I just wanted to make a point of where the um, washrooms are, if you want to wash your hands or anything. So as you come out of this door, if you go straight down the corridor by the big red screen, um, the washrooms are just down there. You can wash your hands. We'll also put tissues um, just in either corner. If you're coughing or sneezing, you know, we don't want to spread germs to anybody. Just, just, just say it because, you know, I think as things are going on, I think we're actually quite lucky talking to the guys at IBM. Um, if this event happened in a week or two later, um, we might have had to cancel or, or pull it off. But yeah, just wanted to get that out of the way, um, just to say. But <laughs> apart from that, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Brett. I'm the Community and Events Manager at Mobile UX London. Um, we've got a fantastic agenda all lined up for you this evening. Um, if I click through, we can see. Um, so we're really pleased to welcome um, Anna, Tom, Chris and Lucy. How the evening will work, um, we'll hear from Anna and Tom, then we'll take a short 10 minute break. Um, stretch your legs, grab some drinks, and then um, just after eight o'clock, we'll come back. Um, we'll hear from Chris and Lucy, um, and we'll do questions in between as well. We'll just take a few, one or two uh, questions. We are streaming as well, so hopefully anyone who's watching can hear us, um, and it's, it's all looking okay. Um, what I'd say with questions, if you just wait for the microphone to come to you, because otherwise anyone who's watching um, won't be able to hear, and they'll probably be a bit confused, you know, what, what we're talking about. Um, so just wait for the microphone to come to you. Um, so I just wanted to say a few other things. So we are planning two more meetups this month. Um, one's coming up in two weeks around driving innovation through data-led design, um, which is hosted by Mixpanel. Um, we're just forming the agenda. Um, we'll probably send an email out tomorrow um, with the details. Um, but that'll be really interesting. Um, we've got different um, consultants looking around how they're using data, but the strategies and um, how they're being creative um, and also some of the behavioral um, analytics that are coming out of data design. And then we're also running an event on research methods at the end of the month. Um, we'll see how things go. We might push these back a bit, um, but our, our plan is to, to go ahead um, until we're told otherwise. Um, but save the date for now um, and we can let you know about other events. We also run uh, training courses. Um, my colleague Adrian, he's outside. Um, he, if you want interest in any of the courses, um, come and speak to me or Adrian, he's looking after them. But if you're interested in doing a beginner or intermediate, um, also a, a voice course, um, these courses we run is very small. It's about 10 people in a room. Um, we just run them for six weeks in the evening. Um, so you're more than welcome to come and speak to us to find out more um, if you want to do a beginner course or intermediate to um, help develop your skills, or if you're interested in voice apps. Um, so just to say here, maybe it's a bit smaller, um, but about working in uh, small teams, we have a range of um, expert UX designers and practitioners, um, and they'll guide you through um, the whole of the six weeks. Um, and it's really collaborative. Some people I know who did the course have made some really great friends and have worked on projects together. Um, so if you're interested, uh, come and speak to us. Our next course, which is coming up, I'll click through, there we go, is um, the voice design course, um, which is actually starting in a couple of weeks on the 30th of March. There's still about two or three more spaces. Um, so if you're interested, um, let us know. And then another big thing that we're working on um, is our conference. We haven't got a pretty slide yet because we're still working on the designs, but we've just booked the um, Museum of London for the 26th of November. Um, did anyone in the room come to the November conference that we ran? Yeah, amazing, cool, a couple of people. Some other people might not know. Um, but this year we're focusing on ethical, responsible and inclusive design. Um, we're just working on the agenda, but we're inviting people um, like champions who are championing accessibility um, and really challenging the ways that their companies work. Um, we're looking, we might build a sustainability part into the agenda as well. Um, we're just um, having conversations. So our conferences, we have a main stage. We also have a separate tech, sta tech stage where we look at um, VR and AR. And then we also run workshops as well. We have six workshops throughout the day. So if you get bored of sitting in one room, um, you can go off into different rooms um, and take part in those as well. So it's, it's normally a really fun day. It'll be our first time at Museum of London. Um, it's a bit of a bigger stage. Um, should hopefully all work quite well. But if you're interested, save the date. Um, we can let you know some more details. 
Um, so really, that's enough for me. Um, I'll be introducing speakers and just looking after Q&A this evening. Um, so it's really over to Anna. Um, and Anna is a, a service designer at LiveWork Studio, um, and she's really helping them in shaping their sustainability offer. Um, today, she's speaking about the role that design could play in reducing the human impact on the planet. Um, and her talk is titled Undesign, Designing in, in the Anthropocene. Um, I'll hand over to Anna. I got it wrong at the end, but we'll hand over. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So Brett already said, uh, I'm Anna from LiveWork Studio, and I just moved like six months ago to London, so sorry for my Denglish. Um, <laughs> uh, I worked for LiveWork before, but then in the Rotterdam studio. And we have been talking a lot about sustainability and today I'll be taking you along on our journey and it's a journey that was very much fueled by one of our founders Ben Reason he when he founded LiveWork he was already thinking about how services could maybe unlock some circular uh, business models and especially the last year uh, we've been been incredibly lucky that he has been inspiring us every lunch uh, and we've been talking about it a lot. So I'll take you on the journey. But before we talk about designing for sustainability, we have to talk a bit about design. So as we are aspiring to be one of the thought leaders in the field of service design, we obviously need to think about what are the key qualities of service design. So let me just take you quickly through the thoughts that we have on that, because we think that there are five main qualities of service design, which are human-centeredness, co-creative, reframing, contextual, and experimental. <coughs> and I'll just quickly take you through them. The first one is human-centered. So design focuses always on the needs and experiences of humans, whether it's clients, patients, or whatever. We think that focusing on their <coughs> and improving their experience is the key to unlocking business and government outcomes. Um, and to do that, we have to work co-creatively because we are never the expert, obviously. Uh, we never really know what this field uh, that we're working in is about. So we need to invite the humans that are part of that thing into our process and be the facilitator uh, of creation rather than the creator on our own. Um, and we believe that design has a quality that enables the unlocking of certain solutions where analytical approaches sometimes fall short. So uh, we really think that by reframing both the problem and the solution space, always reframing it helps you to get to totally new solutions. And we usually do that by asking the question, what if, blah, 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 it could be anything. So what if is one of our most used questions. Then, we're not un unique in this, but we always try to design contextual. We don't believe that anything uh, has any value if we don't take into account the, yeah, the context in which the solution is used. Um, so that means that we have to talk to the people that are uh, actually using the horseshoes if we are creating a service for uh, a horseshoe manufacturer. Um, and last but not least, we fundamentally believe in experimenting. So making, testing, iterating, <laughs> learning and improving, bringing in the freedom of experiment um, and also de-risk everything through exper experimenting. So for us, these are the key qualities of design. And then when we take these key qualities and take them into sustainability, we want to frame that in the context of the Anthropocene. Just a quick introduction on the Anthropocene for people who have never heard of it. I'm not an expert, so I'll keep it short. But the Earth system scientists um, classify the Earth's history on a timeline um, of epochs based on the qualities of the geological features of the Earth. So whenever the Earth fundamentally changes, it's a start of a new epoch. 
Um, and the scientists tell today tell us that with great confidence that we just entered a new epoch, uh, which is fundamentally shaped by humans because we've left such a big impact on the geological features of the Earth that this is a new uh, epoch, which we call the Anthropocene. And um, there's a lot of evidence for this Anthropocene, and you've probably all seen them in the media, but I'll take you through three of those just to show the fast range and the big uh, and the long duration of this um, factors. So just a few humans have changed the carbon composition of the atmosphere. Humans have um, brought in fertilizers, which have a huge impact on the soil uh, ecosystems. Um, and I don't even need to tell you about the impacts of plastics because you've all uh, seen that everywhere. So why are we bringing design in Anthropocene? Why are we not calling it eco-disaster or um, ecological crisis? Well, for us it's important that we recognize that it's not something that we are trying to find a solution to. No, we are going to have to accept that we're in a new epoch now and we just have to deal with that. We have to adapt to it. So we have to adopt design to the idea that humans can have and are already having a huge impact on the geological features of the earth. And we need to yeah, make sure that our concept of design fits to, this, to that new epoch. So what does that mean for the qualities that I just described to you? Um, well, for that, we need to take in some ideas of people from outside of our field that have been thinking about uh, this for a while now. So the great thinkers of our time, we're starting to build a big library at LiveWork to inspire us. And um, I'll take you through their thinking and I'll apply it to these key qualities of design. Um, so the first one, uh, yeah, I'll just start with human-centered and take you through the other ones. So the first one, uh, human-centered. Um, well, in the book Humankind, written by Morton, he kind of says that humans have forgotten that we're part of this big ecosystem. We always think that we're super in independent, but we're actually not. We're super interdependent. We have a large influence on the ecosystems around us, and they are now starting to have an impact on our world as well. So that means that it's a bit weird that we've only been considering what humans find desirable, feasible, uh, and viable, and that is starting to bite us in the ass. Um, and this is difficult, uh, because as Morton says in his book, it's really difficult for us to think of other living beings as part of the same group, so to say. Our language doesn't even allow it. Um, so he comes up with this concept of non-human people, um, so that we might start giving them a more equal say in our design processes. So can we bring these ecosystems, these living beings, or these um, bacteria or animals or whatever, into the boardroom, like we're now bringing in the experience of clients into the boardroom? Can we bring in the experience of ecosystems into the boardroom? Can we make them actual stakeholders in our design process? So, for example, in New Zealand, they just um, um, made a river a, a legal entity. So this river has rights. That's a really interesting concept. Can this river then also be a stakeholder? Um, so can we be more than human-centered? Um, for the second key quality, I'm going to quote um, this guy called Daniel Christian Wall. He wrote a very interesting article called Expanding the Concept of Design. And he says, our focus on industrial design uh, and produced products and services um, are, are failing because it is resulting in a loss of diversity, pollution, erosion, and whatsoever. 
So maybe we need to redesign design. And he takes a very broad uh, idea of design. He says design is all about uh, exploring and capturing with how we want something to be rather than how it already is. So we're designing the future, so to say. But if you, uh, if you take that as the definition of design, it is actually way broader than how we use it now. We only apply it to product or service design, whilst actually if we're voting, we're kind of co-creating uh, the future poli uh, uh, politics of a country. So he's, tr he's trying to stretch our idea of design. He says, we are designing all the time and we should be more conscious of that. We should be more, um, uh, we should be more responsible in this constantly uh, de uh, designing uh, that we're constantly doing. Um, so if we're more mindful and responsible of, of that, we can extend our concept of co-creative and we can, uh, we can see in, in voting or in whatever process of uh, deciding the future, we can see that we're co-creating. And we should also be mindful of who else is co-creating. Are we including enough people in the co-creation <coughs> of a law, of the co-creation of a new system or the co-creation of whatever? So, for example, should we invite this river uh, that they have in New Zealand to our co-creation process? So yes, we, still, we should still be co-creative, but we should be hugely co-creative. Then, a very important one in this um, talk is, we th we've been talking about reframing design, but if we really wanna go into, uh, bring design into the Anthropocene, we should also think about reframing prosperity. Um, and um, Tim Jackson, Jackson, in his book, argues that Prosperity is way more than material wealth. He says it's about um, a sense of security that um, allows you to live healthy, to live happy, to live, live a meaningful life. And that's actually not captured in the measure that we most often use um, for uh, prosperity, which is GDP. And that's still very much focused on material wealth. So in our case, as designers, industrially designed uh, products and services might add material wealth, but if they pollute our lungs, if they drive loneliness, or if they promote an unhappy and unhealthy lifestyle, shouldn't we also calculate that in our uh, a measure for prosperity? So, and moreover, he also argues that the idea of infinite growth is impossible if you're living on a earth with finite uh, resources. So for design to be relevant in the Anthropocene, we really need to reframe what prosperity means. We need to reframe what we value. And we also need to reframe how we get to what we value. Um, because if the process actually destroys the system in which that value exists, and, uh, then we have a problem. Then the contextual one. Um, I already said a little bit about Anthropocene, and it's really special because it's the very first time in 4.6 billion years that one species on its own is radically impacting the Earth system. And um, in his book, Hamilton says, well, if you have the power to make such an impact, that also means that you have the responsibility that comes with that power. So we have created the earth in the state in which it is now. Um, so we also have the responsibility to protect it for the sake of our own species, but also for its worth. So we need to start designing ecologically contextual. Um, the last one. Um, always experimental. We already said that exper doing experiments is key to our work, um, but Taleb takes it in, in his book, Anti-Fragile, takes it to a whole new level. Um, and for that, I have to explain a bit about fragileness. So he says, currently, 
we're, we're seeing this scale from something that's super fragile, that it breaks easily, that you, with just a change or a shock, it breaks. And on the other side of the scale, we see, uh, we say it's robust. So, but he says, no, the scale is way bigger than that. On the other end, it's anti-fragile. So that means things that don't break with shock or with change or with disruption, but things that thrive on shock and uh, disruption. Um, and robustness is something in, in the middle of that scale. Um, and that's a really interesting uh, concept. So just an example of what is anti-fragile. Uh, an anti-fragile process would be, for example, evolution. So evolution really thrives with experiments, with trial and error. The process is built around that, so you could say it that way. So we're trying to figure out, can we design services that even after they've been implemented are still experimental? So they still get better every time it experiences a shock or experiences change. Um, so that, that would really make uh, our services way more fitted to the Anthropocene. So that brings us to the very first draft of the key uh, values of design in the Anthropocene, which is more than human-centered, hugely co-creative, reframing prosperity, ecologically contextual, and always experimental. And we are very curious to know your thoughts, and we really hope that you'll help us to explore this topic even further. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Anna, for such an insightful talk. And I think we've got a really great, everyone's got a reading list now. There's so many books that we need to get through. We'll hold you on stage. I just want to open up the floor for any questions. Um, before I do, I forgot to say at the beginning, we have a hashtag for this evening, which is MUXL Meetup. Um, obviously, it's a great way to connect um, with each other, but also those watch, if anyone's watching us online, um, if you want to put any questions on there, there's a chat um, feature, or if you're on Twitter or any of the social networks, um, just use hashtag MUXL Meetup. Um, we can get some conversations going on there as well. Um, but we've got time for two questions. If anyone had any questions for Anna, if you want to put your hand up. So there's one here. So Adrian, are you able to so just the gentleman in the black T-shirt? Um, if you just wait for the microphone and we'll, um, yeah, and we can hear you. Perfect. Hi. Hi. Um, thanks very much for that. That was really interesting. Um, I was interested in your thoughts on um, the concept of entropy. Um, a lot of sort of the, the slides that you were showing seem to show that um, the sort of concept of human seeing that anything that isn't human is like defiant, as, as was the name of that book, um, and sort of wrong because um, it doesn't fit into our plan. Um, would, would you say entropy sort of relates to that, the concept of, oh, we make stuff and then it slowly degrades and falls apart, but actually that's nature having a part in the process? Oh, I love that question. I don't immediately have an answer to it, to be honest. Um, what, sorry? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. It's really, it, you're really sparking a thought for me now. So thank you for that. I really don't know. Um, I've, I've had some talks with people that said, well, entropy thing is not really true because blah, blah. Um, no, I don't know. Thank you. We're going to think about this one. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Hi. Uh, great talk. Uh, just a uh, quick, um, quick question because I'm an MA student from UAL and we worked with Green Lab last week on a circular economy design thinking. Mm -hmm. So when you mentioned anthrop Anthropocene, Mm -hmm. uh, so are you, are you like trying to create a circular economy design thinking with the services you're you're like trying to produce? Or like yes, we are busy trying to find out how services could be more circular. Mm -hmm. um, so we're because it's really interesting because we are always so focused on humans, while circularity needs this aspect of of, of material flows mm -hmm. and this very logistical. Um, thing. Um, so we're um, combining our efforts with companies that are thinking about that a lot. And we're trying to 
see how they can like design the whole the streams of material whilst we design how humans are actually going to do that because yeah in the end the materials need do need to get go back somewhere or they need to go somewhere or whatever so how do you design that in a way that it's uh, desirable and, and that it's nice sorry a service that would be reusable in the future yeah yeah definitely yeah r but we're, we're, I, we're really starting this thinking mm. we're not there yet so yeah. i think like everyone else um but this is definitely what we're thinking about all the time okay. yeah thanks mm. thank you so much and thank you for your question thank, thank you, you very much Anna. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so next up this evening, before we have a break, um, it's a great pleasure to invite Tom. Um, he's the co-founder of Whole Grain Digital, which is London's original WordPress agency. Um, it's also a certified B Corp and a specialist in web performance and sustainability. Um, his talks around sustainability, um, sustainable UX for everyone, um, and his talk will focus on how digital decisions impact carbon emissions and how sustainability can be used as a lens for which we can improve UX. So I'll hand over to Tom, and that's your clicker. Thank you. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to specifically talk about the, sort of the digital side of sustainable design this evening. And I'm just going to start off with sort of the, some of you already know this, but I'll start off with the sort of headline statistics. Is this the right clicker? Yeah. <laughs> um, but basically, people don't really generally think that the internet has much of an impact. It's not on people's radars in the way that maybe flying or driving a car or using electricity at home is. And um, but internet emissions are huge. The internet uses roughly the same amount of electricity as the whole of the UK. Um, so it is like a country. And if it was a country, its emissions would be roughly equivalent to Germany, which is the sixth biggest polluter in the world. And it's basically because everything in the internet uses electricity. It's the biggest machine humans have ever created. It spans the entire globe, um, its data centers, its transmission networks, all of the repeater stations, and then the millions or billions of devices that are constantly connected 24 hours a day um, to the internet, consuming data, sending data. So we set about trying to figure out what does these big top level statistics, what do they mean from the point of view of an individual website? Um, so a couple of years ago, we developed websitecarbon.com, um, which allows you to put in a URL and get a, an idea of what are the individual emissions of that, that web page. Um, and the average, we've tested over a quarter of a million web pages so far, and the average so far is 1.676 grams of CO2 for an average visit, and that's factoring in sort of repeat visitors and the hosting and so on. So this is quite a lot. It's like a sugar cube of in weight of gas every time somebody visits a web page and we're all like clicking away constantly all day visiting stuff. So this adds up really, really fast and there's a lot of stuff that we can do in terms of design decisions that help to bring this down. So as I mentioned, these are the sort of the three places where, um, where we're using electricity, data centers, transmission networks and end user devices. From a design point of view, sort of, or UX point of view specifically, rather than a technical point of view, it's mainly in the transmission networks and the end user devices that we can really have a big impact. Although from a technical point of view, there's loads of stuff we can do on the data center end as well. Um, but I'm going to focus on these sort of last two points today. So I've got sort of seven top tips from a design point of digital design point of view of how you can reduce these emissions. So the first thing is basically streamline user journeys. Um, if every page that we're visiting is using electricity to send data, and the more time that we spend on the internet, the more electricity we're using, then streamlining user journeys is the single best thing probably that we can do. If people have to go like four levels deep to find the page that they're looking for, then that's a lot of pages they have to load. It's a lot of time wasted. It's a lot of electricity wasted. If they can get straight to what they want, then that's just good for them, it's good for the environment. Um, so, you know, not just the levels of de de depth, but like preventing dead ends, like look at your analytics, find out where people are getting stuck and they're not finding what they want. Um, and also look at SEO, like what's your, what's your negative bounce rate? So bounce rate's a funny metric, but a lot of people who bounce off pages 
are bouncing off because they didn't find what they wanted. So optimizing the user journey, not just on your site, but in terms of how people arrive and where they're going after your site, can really reduce the amount of time people spend, the amount of data they have to load to achieve what they're trying to achieve on the internet, and they will thank you for it. Um, the second thing is, and this is a really big thing, use images efficiently. So like use less images, that's like the obvious one. Images tend to be really big files, and most websites that we look at where they've got some sort of um, page speed problem, images are like one of the first things that we look at. Um, so you can use less images. You can use like vector files and CSS styles instead of photographs. They're way more efficient in general. Um, but also think about like when, if you are going to use a photograph, think about how you're going to use it, like the context in which you're going to use it from a design point of view. So I'll just give, run you through an example of how one image could be used in a really inefficient way or it could be used in a much more efficient way. So this photograph at 1, 280 by 800 pixels with no compression as a JPEG, 1.2 megabytes. Like that's massive. Without the rest of the web page, if you put that on a web page, that's already 1.2 megabytes. So, but a lot of people will put that on their website. They'll put it like full screen at the top of the page with no compression. But if you halve it in size and like put white space around it, and white space is good, um, <laughs> then you can get that down with. I don't know why we're skipping forward, but <laughs> you can get that down massively. Um, but this next thing here, if you blur the edges of the picture, if you look at the left-hand image, it's basically the same photograph, but I blurred the edges, and it's 47% smaller as a file, but the image is exactly the same size. And, okay, you might not want to blur the edges of your image, but actually, in a lot of cases on the web, no one's going to notice that you did that. Um, and you can, dis you can control which bits you blur, um, have some fun with it. But you can also get it even smaller, make it black and white. So color is, you know, it's data, it takes up space. So you make the same image black and white, it's 33% smaller than the one on the left, and it's 64% smaller than the original one of the same size. If we go to the next page, then convert the same images from JPEG to WebP. WebP is way more efficient than JPEG, and every website should be using this now. Nearly all the browsers support it. So just converting them with almost no compression, um, you can get the files down significantly smaller. So basically, the image on the right in WebP format is 81% smaller than the original image of the same size. Um, and yeah, it's black and white, but you know, maybe on some websites that's a good, good, good look. Um, <laughs> But even if it's black and white, you can add the color back with CSS. So, um, so you can use CSA, CSS overlay effects, um, and it doesn't change the image size at all, but it adds some sort of visual style back in. And you can use these in sort of interactions and so on, so that it actually creates a bit of life and doesn't um, make everything flat. So loads of things you can do with images to get files really, really small. And as I said, this is WebP files with almost no compression. It's like 96% quality. You could shrink that down even further. Um, so this is a 67 kilobyte image. That one we started with was 1.2 megabytes. Um, it looks basically the same. So the next thing, obviously, following on from images is use less video. Video files are massive, streaming video uses a huge amount of data. And that's okay if there's like a good reason to be using video. If that's like the best format to communicate what you're communicating, then you know, let's not be let's not be sort of Puritan about it. But there's a lot of things we can do. Like autoplay video is often annoying. Um, it uses loads of data for every person that visits, even if they don't want to watch the video. If it's got sound, then you know you could get some people fired for <laughs> visiting your website while they're supposed to be doing work. Um, but also question whether video is the best content format. Like video is not always that great if you want to learn something. It's it's good in some contexts, but often it's not the best. It doesn't give you control over the timeline. So if you're looking for something quickly and you just want to like skim read something, find a fact, and move on. And then there's like a five minute video and you don't know whether the thing you want to know is in that video somewhere. You have to watch the whole video just to find out that that was a waste of time. So video is not always brilliant. Um, so think carefully about what your users are looking for, what they want to consume, and whether video is the right format. Um, if you are going to use video, just see how short you can make it. You don't, not everyone wants to watch like a full length feature documentary. 
Um, avoid animated GIFs. They're just horrible files. And, <laughs> and they're really inefficient because it's basically just loads and loads of GIF images stuck on top of each other. So if you're going to use something that looks like a GIF, convert it to a video because um, video is way more efficient. And use MPEG-4 format or in future, whatever the next most efficient thing is that comes out of that. Always use the most efficient file formats. So number four, use system fonts. So system fonts is basically the fonts that come on your device by default. Not everyone likes them. Um, it's things like Arial, Times New Roman. On Android devices, you've got Roboto. Um, and yeah, OK, a lot of designers hate system fonts because they look old fashioned and they're not very exciting. But you get them for free. Like You don't have to load anything. They're already on everybody's devices. Um, and some websites use these really well, like Hotels.com only uses system fonts. And that's great for web performance. Um, it keeps their file sizes down. If you must use custom fonts, which you probably want to, um, <laughs> then optimize them as far as you can. So um, this is just an example of an open source font called InterUI. It comes by default as a TTF series of TTF files. It contains 2,192 characters, 39 languages. It comes in nine weights, and every single weight is 300 kilobytes. So if you wanted to use all nine weights on your website, you, that's nine times 300 kilobytes. You do the maths. Like your, <laughs> your website's huge. But it doesn't have to be this way. You can reduce the number of weights that you use. So you probably don't need all nine weights. So on our website, we use InterUI. We only have one weight, um, which we use for headings. Um, then you can change the file format. You can convert it really easily. So convert it from TDF to WAF2 makes a huge difference in file size. But then you can also subset fonts. So we don't need 2,192 characters on our website. And we don't need 39 languages, because our website is only in English. So we basically stripped out all the characters that we're never going to need. And we got it down to 98 characters, which covers two languages. I don't know what the second one is. Um, <laughs> It's whatever language uses the same characters as English. Um, and the file size is 7 kilobytes. So we've shaved, saved, shaved nearly 98% off the file size um, just by doing that. And no one will ever know. It looks exactly the same because we're just not loading stuff that we were never going to use. So my tip number six is go easy on the icing. Um, and what I mean by icing is like all those fancy, fun things, that, like the jazzy stuff that people love on a website um, that doesn't really do anything practical. Um, so we're talking about animations, like sh shapes transforming, parallax effects, um, cropping things into like sh masked shapes, things like that. This stuff can look great. It can be fun. And there can be good uses for it. So, um, But think carefully about how you use it. It can really use a lot of CPU energy. So even though it might not increase file sizes, if, if the fans start whirring on somebody's laptop when they visit that website, then you know there's a problem. And, and you can use this tool. Whoop, you can use the tool um, in Safari developer tools in the browser Safari. Um, they've got an energy impact monitor, which is the right hand dial. Um, so, if, so basically just experiment, like try different effects that you think are going to create a good user experience, like nice interactions and things, and test the energy impact and see which ones you can get sort of the best bang for your buck um, and just keep learning. And then number seven, use low energy colors. So this is only relevant on OLED screens because they light up each pixel individually, whereas sort of older screens like LCDs and uh, CRT screens, um, well, LCD screens in particular, not CRT, um, it doesn't make any difference what colors you use. But on OLED screens, it does make a difference. And most new phones use OLED screens. A lot of new laptops use them. A lot of TVs now use them. And basically, because they light up each pixel individually, white uses the most energy, because white light is the brightest. Black doesn't use any energy, because it's basically the whole screen switched off. Um, <laughs> dark colors are low energy, for obvious reasons. And then if within the colors, weirdly, blue uses about 25% more energy than green or red pixels. So basically, the darker you can make your designs, the less white you can use, the less blue you can use, the better, which is bad, because Whole Grain Digital's entire brand is mainly white and blue. <laughs> um, <laughs> so 
we are changing our brand color palette quite drastically, <laughs> very soon. <laughs> um, so that is my seven top tips. Um, and the benefits basically of doing these things, thinking about sustainability in digital design, um, you will shorten user journeys. People will thank you for that. You will deliver better web performance. That's only ever gonna be a good thing. Um, your SEO will improve because not only have you thought about SEO in its own right, but you've also improved web performance, which is good for Google rankings. Better accessibility, so by making things super, super efficient and making them able to work on low-powered devices, it's, it's easier for people who have rubbish internet connections and poor quality devices or old devices or you know whatever happens to be their, their limitation um, easier to access your website without being frustrated. Um, and of course, less energy and emissions. And there's only one downside, and that's that it needs attention to detail. And we're all busy, we all have limited amounts of time, and sometimes it just feels like stopping and thinking about these things is not the highest priority. But actually, when we do it, the benefits are huge. So it's, it's really worth it. So that's pretty much the end. I encourage you to go and take a look at the Sustainable Web Manifesto, read it, sign it, um, and experiment, share your ideas. Thank you so much, Tom. I think there's some really good like, practical insights and, and takeaways and, and so many great messages and um, hopefully a lot of what everyone was really interested in hearing about. Um, I was chatting with Tom, um, something I found really interesting today, the BBC um, published a documentary called Dirty Streaming. Um, it's only a BBC Three kind of short 25 minute documentary. Um, but it was really interesting around video and all of the streaming and, you know, Netflix, Amazon Prize, what everyone's doing when they get home and we're such big, heavy content users um, and the amount of power that that's taking and the transmission yeah. energy around the world. Um, yeah. Something I learned that even um, for a HD video, if you switch to SD, then it uses between four to five times less energy um, and actually human eyesight and different things we don't need all of this super high quality um, and even the guys at the back so tonight they only stream in 4k so it's kind of oh okay that's that's pretty easy a lot of power but um it just gets the brain you know there's there's so many things for us to think about i think as um majority designers um people working in product in the room there's there's lots of things um, we can take away from tonight and continue the conversation as well um so we open the floor up to questions is there any questions for tom yeah, we've got the gentleman here. If you just wait for the microphone so we can hear you um, at the back. So we'll run around. Cool, yeah, perfect. I'm, uh, I'm not sure if this falls beyond the remit of the talk, but earlier on you touched upon the fact that um, you know even hosting can have significant impacts on the... Uh, I guess the environmental footprint a website has. Do you know of any providers, maybe AWS or Google, that have uh, that are very environmentally conscious that we can maybe make a concerted effort of maybe using more of in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So, like data centers do use a huge amount of energy, and I've the two key factors there are looking at the ones that have a credible and strong commitment to renewable energy in their data centers, um, and the ones that have a strong commitment to energy efficiency, because that's equally important. Um, Google is sort of the most sort of well known in terms of pushing the boundaries of what the industry can do in terms of energy efficiency and they've also made a commitment to 100% renewable energy which they say they've achieved. Once you start digging into it, it all gets very blurry as to what 100% renewable energy really does mean in practice um, and nobody's there yet really in practice and Google even themselves will admit it if you, you really dig into it. But um, but Google is a good one. There's some smaller companies like Positive Internet, which are based in London, and their data centers in Cambridgeshire. Um, uh, Crystal Hosting, who are also a UK-based one, have quite a strong commitment. Um, Qualo is another one that people have said to us is good. We haven't personally used them. Um, and then there's loads of stuff that's built on top of other providers. So there's loads of hosting companies that are basically piggybacking off Google's data centers and providing other services. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I thought that was really interesting. Do you have any kind of tips or examples of how you uh, sell in these ideas to clients or stakeholders, how you convince them to? 
cut stuff. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> so it's really hard. Um, <laughs> everyone likes shiny, flashy things, right? Um, even if there's no like tangible rationale for them. Um, so what we found is like you've got to figure out what the client really cares about. And some clients might really care about the environment, and that might be something that they actually want to engage in as an issue, and they want to actually sort of look into it deeply and, and go on that journey. For a lot of clients, even though they may care about it, it's not the top of their priority list. It's the nice to have. Um, so you've got to figure out what they do care about. And we tend to find that they care more about things like web performance, SEO, accessibility. So that's fine. Um, ultimately, you can achieve the you can achieve the efficiency, but under the guise of one of the other things. So, yeah, try and figure out what they care about and sell it to them that way. That's, it's not always easy. It doesn't always work. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Um, so I think we'll head on to, do you have a one, one question from Chris? Yeah. Can you get a microphone just over to Chris? So, yeah, one more question, then we'll head for a break. So. Thanks, Tom. Great presentation. I'm speaking after the uh, break, so you can ask me a really difficult question after this. But um, <laughs> actually, it's not a difficult question. Yeah, just uh, uh, mine's about um, whether there's a sort of decoupling point between uh, w the way we decarbonize energy generation. Because, of course, you know, kind of, I guess the whatever the footprint of the internet is increasing, but simultaneously the footprint of energy generation as we decarbonize and move to renewables is decreasing. So, is there any, is your 1.6, whatever it was, grams? know, sort of reducing as a result of, a, of, of renewable energy it policies? Is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's also reducing as a result of the technology that powers the internet is constantly getting more and more efficient. So data centers are getting more efficient, the transmission networks are getting more efficient, and our devices, our phones, our laptops, and so on, are constantly getting more energy efficient. So that number per page view is always going to be coming down. And eventually, we will create a truly zero carbon world. Maybe <laughs> who knows when? But eventually it should become a non-issue because the internet will be so efficient and all of the world's energy will come from renewables. Problem solved. We're so far from it currently that um, we st still got to treat it as the issue that it is. But yes, you're right. Eventually we'll get there. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll head on off for a, a 10 minute break. So if I can ask everyone back in their seats at eight o'clock, um, feel free to stretch your legs. And also, um, I want to set you a challenge to talk to someone that you haven't met before um, in the break, just because these events are great for networking. And I was talking to my um, friend and if on the stage you allow people permission to talk to someone you haven't met before, it makes things a bit easier. We're weird and British. It's, it's funny. <laughs> but um, talk to someone you don't know and we'll convene back at eight o'clock. Thanks. <laughs> it feels so good. So how did you get on with your challenge? Did you talk to someone different? Yeah? You tried? If not, try again later at the end. Um, and it'll be good for networking. Um, so we'll start back up. Um, our next speaker is Chris, uh, so Chris Sherwin. When we started talking, I um, really wanted him to speak tonight because he told me um, that he's a, he's a product person. He makes real things. Um, he's had over 20 years experience and now has his own um, sustainable um, design studio and consultancy. Um, and I think that's, that's important to think about the, the product side and, and the real things to kind of move the conversation on from um, digital and, and websites as well. Um, so Chris is the founder and director of Reboot Innovation, um, which is a specialist sustainable innovation and design consultancy. Um, he's been in the field for over 20 years and has helped to develop several world first sustainable products, including the multi award winning Fairphone 2, um, which some of you may remember as was the world's most um, ethical um, smartphone. And that's a whole, when we were talking, we almost could have done a whole talk around <laughs> all of the products and things that go into our mobile phones. And when we think about sustainability, we kind of forget about all the things we're carrying around in our pockets and using every day um, and all the parts that go into those. Um, but in his talk, so Chris, he's going to be questioning um, whether today's dominant design methods, which is human-centered design and design thinking, if they can really help us through the climate emergency or whether it's time for a drastic rethink in the ways that we design. So I'll hand over to Chris. Thank you very much. <laughs> am, I, am, I am I okay with the mic? Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, you, know, you know when you write those bits of text and send them in in the beginning and then <laughs> actually hear somebody saying them, I think, oh, that's a little bit too long. 
<laughs> it goes a little, a, little bit too, a little bit too grand. Oh, well. Um, cool. So I'm um, delighted to be here. Um, I'm, also, I'm also half tempted to start by answering the entropy question. <laughs> but, but actually, I think I'm going to come back to that one at the end, if, if, if it's okay. I thought it was a brilliant question. Um, but um, so I'm, I'd like to um, take 15 or 20 minutes of your time to talk about um, about design, and I think how um, I believe design has to change to make it fit for a sustainable future. Um, and um, in truth, there's probably quite a lot of overlap with your presentation, <laughs> and I, th I think I'll be making several of the same points. Um, it's one of the downsides of being third rather than first. Um, but um, I, um, I think um, I guess what I can also do is start to illustrate uh, some of the points I'm making with some some of the things that I've worked on over the over the last. Um, over the last few years. So, first of all, a little bit about me and my, uh, my business. So I run, I run Reboot Innovation, and um, we, we specialize in sustainable innovation and design. Um, and I've been doing that work for actually 25 years this year. Um, and I got into sustainable design. I trained as a product designer. Um, and I, I got into this before we called it sustainable design. We used to call it green design back in the mid 90s. Uh, and then we changed the term to eco design. And since then, we're struggling to work out what, what to call it, whether it's sustainable design or circular design or sustainable innovation. Um, but it's nice to see that it's sort of grown and become a more kind of mainstream um, concept now. Um, and essentially, that's what we do. We help businesses, innovators, and to some extent also even designers um, with ideas and innovations for a better world. The ideas and the innovations bit's quite important because I do quite a lot of sort of front-end innovation projects that are about almost pre-brief helping organizations work out what they should be designing. And then the, the, the innovation stuff is usually working on re real things you know, that, that look often better in the images and the presentations you show. Here's just a few things that I will have worked on over the last few years. Um, I'm going to talk about the one on the left anyway. Um, Fairphone, you mentioned already. Fairphone 2 was a fantastic project to work on, um, which was, yeah, I think Greenpeace voted it the world's... Um, kind of most ethical smartphone being ethically sourced and repairable and modular, upgradable, lasting five years instead of two years. Um, one that it might be worth you checking out is one of the last things I worked on last year was Winnow Vision. So Winnow's an amazing business, absolutely in your world. Um, so Winnow offer a kind of um, um, software as a service um, solution for commercial kitchens to, um, to essentially cut their food waste in half. Um, and the product that you see there is, a, is, a, is the world's first AI-enabled smart bin that uses AI machine learning and image recognition to sort of monitor and track the stuff that you, the stuff that a kitchen will throw away into the, into the smart bin, um, feeds that back to a kitchen and shows them that it's roughly equivalent to the entire profit margin, about 2 to 12% of everything they, they use in a kitchen uh, gets thrown away at the end. So, so there's some projects. I do, pro I do work with clients and clients, but I also occasionally team up with, with design agencies. So if any, any of you guys are looking for, you know, it's not, it's not unfamiliar for me to you know, kind of be the sustainability brains on a design project where d design agencies need support as well. And I just thought I'd mention that while, while I was here. But I want to um, essentially focus on, this is, this is I guess, the big, the big point of my presentation. It's this you know, need to move, move beyond our current principles, the current sort of, I guess, you know, if you like, the pillars on which we've built design, um, you know, design, design, uh, the design process today. And the way I'm thinking about it and talk about it is shifting from human-centered uh, human to humanity-centered design. And I wanted to start with this. Anybody know what? Anybody know this? I know you're going to back away from me because I'm showing stuff now. You know, kind of in a digital, digital event, I'm showing a thing. Anybody know what this is? It's a chair, clearly. <laughs> it is a chair. Well done, you lot. <laughs> You're close. Le Corbusier, that's a, that's a very good guess. So it's actually by Marcel Breuer. It's called the Vasily Chair, designed in 19 uh, 1925 at the height of modernism. Right, so Breuer, the story, the story and, and, and in fact, if, you've, if any of you have gone through art school training, you know, the Bauhaus, where this was first designed, I mean, it will have shaped absolutely en your entire design training. You know, kind of being trained as a designer, essentially, you know, our sort of the discipline and the principles of design were created during the Bauhaus. And actually, this is a physical manifestation of that, right? So Breuer was cycling along on his bicycle, noticed the fabulously 
twisted and bent you know, tubes. Saw that all chairs at the time were, were created f uh, just using you know, timber. I thought, brilliant, I'm going to make a chair out of tubular steel, the cutting edge of technology. You know, kind of encapsulates all of, the think all of the best thinking of the time. You know, modernism, it's egalitarian, it's cheap, it's accessible. You, know, so you can capture sort of socialism in, in, in this design. It's not bling or expensive. It's not, it's not for the elite. And in a sense, you know, kind of this, is, this is what we know about design. It sort of responds to and shapes the, sort of ideology, the ideology and the philosophies of the time. In this case, it was modernism. We've seen that happen throughout the 20th century through things like the space race, um, you know, even looking back to the Industrial Revolution. You know, design is, in a sense, a sort of, you know, whatever, a, a, a product or a physical manifestation of the time. If I track forward to today, uh, what are the dominant, you know, kind of, I guess, the design philosophies that we use? Well, it's probably human-centered design and it's kissing cousin um, design thinking, right? So, I mean... Design think is even in the Harvard Business Review now. CEOs of leading organizations are talking about design thinking. Wasn't it IBM's just hired a thousand, a couple of years ago, hired a thousand design, design thinkers. You know, in a sense, as, as all of us guys trained as designers, this is going to make our hearts sing. This is exactly where we really always wanted to be. You know, that um, you know, sort of human-centeredness is you know, almost, it's gone mainstream now. You know, it's, um, but of course, I guess it's, you know, as that's happened, and it's brilliant that that's happened. I think it is only right to ask, you know, kind of, well, well as we move from a, a world, you know, 20th century world that was about, you know, kind of growth and about industrial processes and about, I guess, modernism into a 21st century where one of the dominant paradigms is going to be ecology and sustainability. Are our, you know, kind of dominant approaches, principles, you call them, Anna? You know, are they still fit for a sustainable future? And I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer it myself. I'm not quite sure they are. <laughs> and I think that we actually need to, you know, kind of, we need to build from what we've got. We need to move on. And we actually need a different toolkit um, that will make design fit for a sustainable future. And I'm, I'd like to talk about, I mean, I think there's a few, actually. I think there's a few things we need to change. I'm just going to talk, I'm just going to highlight three and then talk in a bit more detail about, about two of them. I had put enough slides in here for three, but I realized I'd gone for about 30 minutes, and Brett would not be happy if I did that. So I'm just going to talk about the first two, but I'll just summarize them now. And again, Annie, you talked about this already, I think. So this is not an unfamiliar one. I think the first one is, you know, what we tend to do in design is we do, you know, we design, we clearly we design for people, we design for humans, but in a sense that's been sort of misappropriated as designing for consumers, often using consumer insight-driven processes very similar to consumer marketing. Um, and actually what we need to do is move, you know, is almost capture and start to add value to a wider bunch of stakeholders, not just users, not just consumers, actually all people that are impacted. That's, that's point one. Point two is, you know, one of the core tools we use, and again, you could probably go into all of the agencies that you represent, and you've got some sort of customer mapping tool. So let's map the journey across sort of experience, you know, being aware and, and, um, you know, using it and making it fabulous to use and then, you know, loyalty. Everybody's got those. Um, but, of course, what that tends to focus on is only, it's only the customer journey, right? And there's a bit that happens before and after, which we just entirely forget about in the design process. And then the third one is actually just about where we create value. So, in a sense, what human-centered design and the desirability, viability, and feasibility models done is that we create business, almost flip business, the logic of, business, just to kind of ch change business problems into user opportunities. So we actually create profitability and business value through making things desirable for, for users. And that's great. It's great for business. It's great for users. What about creating value for everybody else? Yeah, so actually, we need to start, we need, we need actually, in our design process, to, to start thinking about, let's create sh value for all. Let's create, sh let's sh create shared value. I'm going to go a little bit into detail showing you I guess some tools from the first two. I mean, I think there's a number of things we need to do. I'll just talk in detail about two. First one, you know, designing for the users. We, s we put users right in the center of the design process. And we often use, as I say, I mean, consumer marketing insight type processes, um, you know, like ethnography and focus groups and interviews. They're, 
core design, um, you know, design research processes that we use right at the start of the process. All of our insights come from you know, kind of users and behavior and their, and their needs. And one of the problems with that, in fact, there's two problems with that, but the first one is consumers actually sometimes get it wrong. <laughs> and, they, and they certainly get it wrong on sustainability. Um, and actually, this, my, my, sub, my field is littered with you know, sort of stories of where kind of consumer, you've slightly put your head in your hands because the consumer research is actually miles off the science. There's often a disconnect between what consumers think <coughs> and, what, and what the science says. A brilliant example of that at the moment is the debate about sustainable packaging. And I'm so thrilled that we are talking about sustainable packaging in, in society more widely and zero waste. But actually, quite a lot of that debate is quite naive, encapsulated by the whole sort of, should we wrap a cucumber? Um, you know, so if you, you know, everybody um, unwrap a cucumber, it's plastic free. You don't get any plastic in the oceans. Of course, I've never heard of a plastic wrapper on the beaches in, <laughs> in the UK, to be honest. So whether or not that's really one of the material impacts, I'm not entirely sure. But, um, you know, an unwrapped cucumber, two to three days. A wrapped cucumber, five to seven days. The big impacts of cucumbers and their packaging by about 95% to 5% is in the production of the cucumber, not in the production of the packaging. So we, you know, so consumers, asking consumers sometimes get it wrong. The second one is that using those traditional kind of design research techniques like interviews and ethnography and things like that, sustainability needs, they're a bit abstract, right? They're a bit intangible, they're a bit long-term. And certainly, most, many of the projects that I've worked in over the years you know, the marketing, CMI, Consumer Marketing Insights, or the marketing people have come back and, you know, at the end of it and said, well, we've done our survey, right, and cost, quality, convenience, et cetera, et cetera, always comes, up, comes, comes out above sustainability. It's like fourth or fifth. And probably over the last few years, it might have moved up to second, fourth, third, or, or sort of fourth. But actually, when we're trading sustainability, which is a secondary benefit against the primary benefit of something like cost and convenience, it usually, it usually, usually fails. You know, it usually, it's kind of a, it's almost using those techniques gives your clients and marketers a reason to drop all of this stuff because it's not the most important thing. Now, almost nobody buys, will use any of your products because they are sustainable. They use them because they're better and because they they, they fulfil a need. You know, that's a job to be done, and they'll buy it as a secondary, a, so a secondary support benefit because it's sustainable. Right. So we need to sort of. I don't know whether our, our research techniques are quite right for the sorts of questions we're, we're asking here. And the way I paraphrase that is, is with this brilliant quote from my sustainability comms mates at Futera. And they say that selling sustainability is not like selling soap. It's more like getting people to use soap in the first place. Right, and again, consumer marketing insight research techniques, you know, design, design research techniques are not particularly good at this. The way I liken it is it's a bit like telling somebody they've got cancer with a text. Now that's not something you do, you know, kind of with a, with a short-term interaction with them. You've got to sit them down and have a proper conversation with them, with them about it. And I think, again, that's, what we, that's where we need to be moving, I think, you know, kind of uh, d design, certainly design research onto. What does that look like in practice? I think we need to start looking for insights from wider places than just consumers and users. I'll show you a tool that I use. This is traffic lighting, red and amber and green hotspots. And what you will see here is a hotspots matrix for the impacts of dairy, so yogurt and milk. <laughs> this is, you know, prop we're, in, we're in the land of products now, so stick with me. Um, but what you'll see there is, you know, across the top are key sustainability indicators. Down the side is the, is the, um, uh, is the sort of stages of that product's life. What we traditionally would do in consumer insights is look down that column. It's only, only the product when it's in the hands of consumers. Right, and you'll see a couple of hotspots there. Right? But of course, what we need to do you, with, with a wider setup, with a wider toolkit, is start to look at other, you know, other impact areas, not just when in the hands of consumers, when we're shipping things around, when they're in production, you know, when, they're, when they're produced and processes, pre processed and actually when they're sourced. And this is, I think, one of the sort of, I guess, the key, key tools that certainly I would use. Because I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'll quickly walk you through what that, what that tells you. So of course it tells you some brilliant consumer insight stuff, like the fact that with a, you know, kind of dare, with a yogurt, it's happened to be about, you know, the yogurt category. Very unglamorous, sorry about that. Um, but, but, but at least every day, um, you know, 
there's a lot of waste from um, buy one, get one free. Sort of incorrect storage in the fridge, letting it go mouldy, throwing it away, et cetera, et cetera. That's classic consumer insight at work. But there's also some stuff you can find that's in different bits of the supply chain. So, you know, we know that dairy products in sourcing, uh, you know, have massive greenhouse gas emissions. And, and again, I'm sure you, you probably know this from agricultural practices and, you know, slurry runoff and rumination, the farting and burping from, of the, of the animals. Um, but also, crucially, in this case, we found that with this, with this manufacturer, they were wasting between 6 and 30% of products because supermarkets were over-forecasting over and over-ordering them. That's pretty interesting to, to find out, right? So that's both a cost to the supplier and then a cost to pay for, for the waste as well. Right, and what these guys did, and this is, this is the Yo Valley, is they did this. And you probably tell what it is from the name. It's called Yo Valley Left Yovers. Um, so it's a limited edition product um, that they actually only produce it twice a year. Um, and when they get to a certain point of that manufacturing waste in the supply chain, it triggers a new and unique flavor. In this case, it was strawberry and fig. That's why it's a limited edition, because they can only use what they've, I don't know, what the supermarkets have wasted for them. Um, and, um, you know, once it's gone, it's gone. Once you've used up all of your... All of your all of your ingredients for this to make maybe two hundred thousand units of this, but they don't have to pay for the materials to be. You know, it's not a loss of of ingredients, and it's not a loss to to have to um, to have them um, dealt with as well. Um, so, and that and that that is a little social product because it triggers a donation for a, a food waste charity as well called Fair Share in the UK. So that shows you a little bit of what you can do by looking more widely than just consumer insights. In this case, that's looking into into in getting insights from manufacturing uh, or from other other areas of the supply chain. Cool. I'm going to move on to the second one, if that's okay. So this one is about, you know, in a sense, you already sort of design for a system, right? You know, kind of. So you, you already look at a system, but I guess the dominant paradigm for design at the moment, the system, is the customer journey. Again, you know, kind of, been in a number of design agencies seen their user experience map or their customer journey diagram, you know, sort of stages of when the product or service is in their hands and that's just an illustration of them. Um, and it focuses chiefly on, the, I guess, the consumption and use, bits of, bits of the experience, bits of the, of the life, I guess, of, of a product. Now, one of the problems with that is that, you know, products have a life, products and services have a life before they got into the hands of people and after they got into the hands of people. And this, this little um, bottle here is a great example of that there could be problems there, right, in where it comes from and where it goes. And I went to a recycler a few years ago on a packaging project. We are talking about, we were getting him to review some work that we were doing. And he's, it's over in um, Dagenham, actually, just um, a couple of miles down the road. And um, his, his big, st we asked him, well, what's, your, what's the most difficult thing you have to deal with? Almost, what's your nemesis? What's the worst thing that, that has come to the factory? And it was this, it was fruit shoots. Right? And, fru and fruit shoots, so when fruit shoots were created, a massive commercial success, right? So, you know, there's nothing like this in the category. So, you know, it was a bit more fruity, but it had an incredible on-shelf standout appeal, just through the purple and the orange, right? So I think within eight years, this was a 100 million pound um, category for, for Britvic. You know, it's got almost won every design award, and there's a massive case study of success but for a recycler right it doesn't get picked up by his he's got an infrared scanner right for plastics and the new materials the new purple and orange doesn't get picked up so it goes through he wants pure white and, and clear and he gets all these purple flakes and orange flakes and then he has to throw the entire ton of recycler away um, you know and of course that would have been quite useful for the designers to know <laughs> in the beginning of the process, right? The fact that what they were doing, although it's a massive commercial success, incredible appeal to consumers, stuffs up the recycling process at the end. That would have been very useful to know at the, at the start of the process. And that's what, so that's, a, that's what happens at the end. You also need to have a think about what happens at the start of your process. This is a case study that I heard somebody talking about actually only two weeks ago. So anybody know the, the Uniglo? This is sort of $50 cashmere sweaters. So again, enormous commercial success. They've sold, probably somebody's wearing one in here, so I'm not trying to catch you out. Um, so this is, um, and it, well, it's to, to, to shortcut this, the story of this is that this is, the demand for this has created almost an artificial um, 
goat herding economy in Afghanistan. Right, and the, natu the carrying capacity for, go for, that, for goats in, the, in that area is about 25 million you know, goats. And it's now up to 60 million. And it's essentially led to a massive desertification in the area <laughs> because, of, because of goat farming and an artificial economy um, you know, being created, just as a direct result of the success of this piece of design. Now, again, that's about where it comes from, not where it goes. If you're the designer of that, it'd be quite useful to know that, <laughs> right? That, you know, that sort of... You know, there might be some implications to your choices of material, which are the things that you're designing and the, thing, the things that you're specifying. So, and I guess where, yeah, where I'm going with this is, you know, we sort of, we, so we, 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 you will be, I'm sure, familiar with customer, you know, kind of customer journeys and user experience. And actually what we need to start thinking about is, you know, the sort of life cycles, you know, that, that things that are life before and after we, we, we produce them. And in a sense, even my, my, my world of environmentalists gets this a little bit wrong, right? Because actually they, they see the use phase as actually a quite instrumental phase. So they never dig around about making that at all desirable for people. So actually, I think our, our real challenge is, uh, is actually to merge those worlds. You know, we sort of need to start putting together the consumer experience um, map, customer journey map, and the, and the life cycle map into this sort of, I guess, the full, the full product journey. What happens after, what happens before, and how we can join up these two circles. So, that's just two ways, right? I think there are others. Just gonna leave you with one final thought. Um, so it's really interesting, just again, to go from low level, sort of what you do in design, up back, back up to high levels. Um, and I think, um, I mean, interesting now, I hear this, um, I hear descriptions of the sustainability revolution being, you know, almost as the same scale as the industrial and agricultural revolutions, but at the speed of the digital revolution. Something really, you know, sort of exciting happening here, like really, really big changes. And of course, I guess my question is, you know, you wouldn't use the same types of design for whatever the agricultural revolution, for the digital revolution. You know, you guys wouldn't give a digital design brief to a product guy like me, because <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't make a very good job of it. So I guess as we move forward, you know, sort of through a climate and ecological emergency into the sustainability age, you know, I think it's time for humanity-centered design. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Chris. Really, really good. Learn, learned a lot. Um, do we have any questions for Chris? I've got the gentleman in the white sweater, yeah, just here. Oh, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so you talked a lot about sort of focusing on the system, and I just sort of wondered like how you justify working in for a dairy company when sort of a lot of people would argue that you know the very existence of the dairy industry is sort of a threat to sustainability. Ooh. <laughs> Good one. Ooh. Um, wow. Um, so well, I mean, my, I, um, I mean, in a sense, we have to st we have to start with what we from where we are. Um, I think, I mean, I don't, I mean, you're right to say that in a, um, you know, in a sustainable world, dairy would be, would have a much, um, you know, much more diminished role. No question about that. It's like one of the, it'll be one of the big sectors where we need to sort of certainly reduce our, reduce our consumption of dairy. I mean, I guess, I, I, mean, I would put Yo Valley's practice, so they're a fully organic dairy, right? And I think I would certainly put their put their practice up against pretty much any other dairy company that you could find as, as one of the as one of the leaders and as, as one of the best practice examples um, and I think my other answer would be um, I mean in a sense you know sort of whether you're up for active engagement or whether you just want to disconnect right so I signed up to um, just before Christmas not to work with oil and gas so I won't do any work with oil, with oil and gas now. And I think that's my, that's the line I've drawn personally in the sand. You know, I think I wouldn't work with, with gambling or defence. Um, but I think I still see some benefit in active engagement with some of these other industries. And I think, you know, as a sort of exemplar of sustainability leadership, you know, proper innovation in this field, I think that stuff's important. You know, I think it's, I think it's really important to do. I think it's really important to show, even if it's catalytic, even if it makes, so that probably saves couple of hundred tons a year of waste but actually you know kind of I'm going to show it to you you know it might, might create waves in the rest of the dairy industry or actually in the rest of the food industry 
I think all that stuff's important. I think it's important work. Thank you. Um, well, there's problems called white light. I'm going to go to Tom if we get a microphone over to the side. So, and I'll come back to you afterwards. So, um, oh, this is the this is the difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the reply. Oh dear. Oh. Uh, this is going to be data. I know, isn't it? Is no. It? Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> it's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talked about the whole sort of cycle and how designers tend to focus on just really the sort of the consumer use yeah. part of the cycle. But I guess that's sort of what they're employed to do in, mo in most cases. So what do you think designers can do to l get their employers to let them sort of explore and actually give value to the other parts of the cycle? Good point. I mean, I think... Um, so I think um, design consulting is very much like that. You know, you sort of you get given a brief, and it's quite hard to stretch outside it. Most of my work's design consulting, so I absolutely know that. Um, I think, I think we've got, you know, kind of it's a classic sort of challenge the brief, and if you're going to challenge the brief, show the benefits of all of this stuff. Um, you know, you've got to almost make the business case for stretching beyond the, be beyond that, and that there will be potentially opportunities uh, for for your clients. Would be point one. I think not all design is done in, in the consultancy model. So you know, the sort of designer entrepreneurial model is an interesting one to explore, right, where you've got much higher degrees of freedom. And in a funny way, quite a lot of the design leadership on sustainability tends to come from entrepreneurial designers and designer makers who are not working for clients, who are actually doing it themselves. Um, so I, you know, I, I hold a little bit more, maybe a little bit more hope. Um, and then I think the third, the third point would be, there's this fabulous diagram for a what from, from that I saw probably 10 years ago when I was sort of scratching my head about you know, well, what are we going to do as designers? You know, sort of can't influence the entire system. Um, and um, it was in a, uh, it was in an IDEO document. Um, it's got lost somewhere. I don't know on the in on the internet. And what it, and well actually, what it talked about was was sort of design at the centre of the. We all want to place ourselves at the centre, right? We're at the centre, centre of the process makes us important. But actually, it was almost kind of design, design facilitating the process for others. And actually, with with complex systems like almost any system, but particularly sustainability systems, you need to get, you know, kind of all of it, you need to get, I mean, in a company, it would be production and supply chain and, you know, marketing and all those guys together. Because you, probably when you start, you don't know where the answer is. Um, and I guess the role of the designer is not to do it themselves. It's actually, it's probably the facilitator's role. You know, the sort of, the, the strong generalist. I guess th that's some of the stuff that we do well. You know, sort of understanding the needs of different stakeholders and, facilitating the process and drawing it all together. Sounds a bit woolly, you know, and in a sense you probably wouldn't necessarily being the, be, you know, be, be, be the superstar, de superhero designer, but I, um, that's, that's a probably a more important role. Okay, and we'll just take one final question. Can I answer the entropy question at the end then? Yeah, yeah. We'll go to <laughs> I'm not sure I can. I'm really setting myself up for a fall here because <laughs> it's such a difficult question. Really. Well, we'll go for it. Um, so picking up on your uh, the quote about selling soap and uh, versus yeah. uh, selling into uh, people washing their hands. So uh, what would you what would you think about doing to um, to sell in sustainability on the internet to consumers, designers, developers? I suppose, but probably more interestingly for me would be the the end users, the consumers, but. Any other thoughts you've got would be great. God, um, how would I sell sustainability in to I, I, into con into consumers of the internet? Of I mean, I think. Um, this, but but when the the, the concept. I that th yeah, that I think so. So so usually mainstream consumers don't understand sustainability as sustainability. They're interested in single issues, right? So they get it. They at the moment they get it through waste. And so you know, sort of because waste is stuff that you often see on the table or goes into your bin, right? that's much more recognisable to people at the moment than, cli than carbon and climate change. That's the invisible bits. Parts per million of carbon, I don't understand that. What does that mean? Um, so, I'd, so I guess I pick topics that are relevant and usually pick single, single topics that sort of resonate with people's lives. It doesn't have to be waste and it'll be different per target audience. But you need, I, I would say, I mean, we've almost, we tr we've gone through the phase of trying to sell the concept of sustainability and everybody thinks it's it's a crap term, <laughs> and they're probably right. So that so so I think consumers want to understand this through sim sing simple single issues like waste, and they probably do understand carbon footprints now. Yeah. So so break it up into manageable pieces, and I think the second thing you should do is 
think about, you know, it's kind of it's the benefits led approach. This and this is properly classic classic marketing, right? That, you know, actually what I mean Tom Tom's was a great was a great example of this. What what sort of more efficient websites do is they make it faster, they you know, they make it less clutter, they're probably easier to read, they're probably easier to navigate. You know, what's the benefits of doing all of that efficient and green stuff for people and, and actually highlight the almost the personal individual individual benefits of it rather than you know, I mean, certainly don't lead on the on the green stuff in, in general. You know, lead on the on the benefits and support it with with the green stuff. Would be my would be my my um, recommendation. Cool. And yeah, if you touch on entropy, and then we'll now we're yeah. uh, we coming we're coming back. Um, I, can't, I cannot do that quick. Okay, we'll touch so on. Yeah, let's see we how we go at the end. Let's see whether that's that's cool. really not awesome. a quick answer. Right? <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Chris. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so our last speaker this evening is Lucy Stewart, and she's a researcher and service designer at Snook, which is a design studio built to make the world more human. She's currently building a design and climate community, which consists of agencies, freelancers, in-house designers, and tonight she's sharing with us what they're up to and also how you can get involved. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm fourth, which means you've heard a lot of this already, and I've also I've had no drink. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, but thank you very much for having me and Brett for the introduction. Um, I've been pretty lucky to talk about design and climate at a number of events, um, and always started with the typical doom and gloom associated with talking about climate change and the ecological emergency. Um, but the community that we built told us that they wanted um, more experience kind of talking about the climate. So about three weeks ago, we ran a workshop about holding climate conversations um, at Unboxed. Um, and uh, I'm kind of experimenting with what we learned there, which is don't start with facts and figures, start with stories and values. So please bear with me um, as I try a new approach um, in into introducing what I'm speaking about today. Um, and instead, I'm going to start here with this question, which is, um, what do you love about living on planet Earth? And I'll just let that sit for a moment for you to think about it. Um, and then I'll share some quick snippets about what I love about living on planet Earth. Um, I love that we can cohabitate um, in a place with beetles that light up and make everything magical. So I grew up in New Jersey with summers heavy in fireflies, um, which was actually pretty, pretty whimsical. Um, through these bugs, I learned about nature's wow and how to care for it. Um, they're now endangered due to light pollution, which is messing up their reproductive cycles. Um, I love that we can nurture soil and plant seeds to produce flowers and food. Um, this is a really small snippet, snippet of my garden in Hackney, um, which is a rather meager attempt at self-sufficiency in light of the fact that agriculture is one of our biggest submitters of carbon, uh, deforestation, and really shoddy land use. Um, and I love that much of this planet is serendipitous as well as it is logical, um, that our lives are based on genetics, but based on luck and circumstance as well. Um, this is wild. So that's me uh, on the in the pink, um, and that's my niece. And we look identical despite being 26 years apart. And I think why this is wild and why this makes me think a lot about the things that I design and I research is because I'm basically designing a future for a mini me. <laughs> and that feels, that feels really strange and also um, fills me with a huge sense of responsibility. Um, so my niece is growing up in New Jersey, but with far fewer fireflies. Um, and that's in part because in the time between these th uh, two photos, carbon in the atmosphere has risen from 350 parts per million to 410. Um, and as a result, the planet is a half a degree warmer. Um, and we're one degree warmer than we were pre-industrial, and we're frighteningly heading towards 1.5 degrees uh, unless we change our habits and behaviors now. And this is all because we're living as if we have three to five planets, um, which leads us from the images I shared to images like this uh, and this, uh, and thankfully to images like this. Um, and I think we can argue that the design of things, whether that be products or services or digital stuff um, and systems got us here in the first place, um, which is why as an industry, and I'm using the, the term design industry quite loosely and quite fully, 
um, we cannot run away from our kind of contributions. And this is what brings me here to talk to you today. Um, uh, and really the question that me and my colleagues at Snook asked ourselves when we uh, put our heads together and like live work, uh, tried to establish what we can do as an agency is start to answer this question about how we hold ourselves accountable for the things that we're producing and that we put out into the world. Um, and how do we hold our our ourselves accountable to ensure that we're designing a better, fairer and healthier planet? Um, and what happened is, ooh, whoa, surprise, is design and climate, um, uh, which is an attempt at this accountability because we need to recognize that collectively we have an awful lot of power to influence our practice, our relationships and our community. Um, but by doing this, we're realizing that it's really, really hard to change practice. I think because of everything Chris said in terms of uh, the process of human-centered design kind of being ingrained within our process, we're really questioning and probing that, but that's actually really quite difficult to do, mainly because we lack the space and the time needed to think about that and approach it um, a little bit differently. Um, and, um, yeah, so what I mean by our practice is like the way we do design, um, which is basically everything Chris told you about, so I'm not gonna say it again. But for us, it's everything from commissioning. So why don't we, why don't commissioners think about uh, climate or planet uh, in the way that they commission things? So why don't they stipulate in their contracts that you, know, you have to think about the climate or planet uh, before we hire you? <laughs> um, uh, and for us, within designing climate, um, this is really about keeping it practical. And what I mean by that is there are a number of groups out there um, and all praise to them um, talking about uh, climate and the practice of design. But to me, it felt quite a kind of talky and hopefully designing climate is a little bit more dewy. And I'll take, I'll take you through some stuff that we've been doing um, to try uh, to interrogate, interrogate our processes and find ways to weave the planet and environment into everything that we quote unquote design. Um, and we're recognizing it that through the workshops that they we're delivering, this creates the necessary space needed to experiment um, because no one feels confident bringing this work into their practice because we're not getting commissioned to do it. <laughs> Nobody's asking us to solve, uh, to think about this um, when they're commissioning us, even within Snook, which is a social innovation agency. Um, and that's a problem um, because really this affects everything. Um, so this was a fascinating article in The Guardian last year um, of the fact that the NHS produces 5.4% of the UK's greenhouse gases, which is wild. Um, and I've met people from uh, the Blood Transfusion Centre um, within the NHS, and he is dumbfounded because he doesn't know what to do about the waste that they have to produce and have to dispose of in the right way. Um, and I think for us, and certainly for me as a service designer, if you look at this, you think, oh my God, there's an awful lot that we that we have to do and we have to look at um, because this covers everything. Um, and there's a real risk that if we get it wrong, we'll perpetuate the inequality that's ravaging the planet already. Um, so low-income communities have far too long borne the brunt of the climate crisis. Um, we see this in London with air pollution. Uh, this is a study done in LA about shade, um, which is why policy interventions like the Green New Deal are so vital and something us tech and designer folks should be far more engaged in as industries across the board. Is anyone familiar with the Green New Deal? Great. <laughs> um, and really this is to ensure that everything that we're designing is crafting a dress changes and to not leave anyone behind. And this is particularly relevant if we're speaking about people with mobility issues or gosh, cognitive, um, cognitive differences. Um, oftentimes they're not even featured when we talk about designing and designing for the planet. And I guess um, our relationships. So how many of you in this room have rubbed elbows with managers, heads of, CEOs, or people of influence? Um, the relationships we create through our practice are instances to bring climate to the forefront of discussion. Um, it also means we need to think about how we change our processes, like I said, com from commissioning all the way through to ending things well. And really for us, going back to some of the conversations maybe Tom that you asked is, can we get in a position where we're able to within our agencies or freelance models or even in-house to say, what if we didn't take that project because it's not, it's, it's not good. <laughs> it's not good for the planet and it's not good for our profession. 
Um, and I think that's part of the confidence that we want to build up within design and climate for uh, the industry to be able to do. Um, and finally, this wouldn't make one ounce of a difference if Snook was doing it alone, um, which is why so much of what we're trying to do is work with our competitors and critical friends to do this together. So there's Jerome from IBM, and I've got uh, Joseph from FutureGov uh, in the audience tonight, um, but also are welcoming others to kind of come and play with us, um, because there's literally enough room for everybody. <laughs> and I think this is one of the biggest things that I've learned is that if somebody wins a contract that feels climate-based or environment-based, great, at least somebody's working on it, um, because there really is enough for all of us to do. Um, so what have we actually been up to? Um, I guess it's important for me to note that this is a side hustle, um, and I'm lucky that Snook give me and my colleagues Ness and Zoe, who I started with, half a day a week to work on climate stuff. And I'm hoping that other organizations will uh, follow suit, because I think until that happens, we'll still be stuck in this period of not really knowing uh, what to do and to be able to kind of test and experiment. Um, and this has enabled Snook, yes, to broaden our own expertise in this area and start to build our own kind of portfolio and projects. Um, and uh, my colleague Ness is taking the uh, sustainable service standard that we're designing and prototyping to another conference tomorrow, um, just as an example of that. Um, but uh, I hope Snook's lead means that other agencies and organizations will think about giving their staff the freedom to experiment and look at this as well. Um, and I guess the first thing we did was, oop, I'm not very good at this. <laughs> Um, acknowledge that there are many, many that have come before us. I mean, I think, Chris, you've been, you've been around um, playing in this space. And uh, in, in one of our workshops that we ran at LiveWork, um, the first thing we did was almost crowdsource all of the tools and methodologies that designers have been producing for years to try and incorporate the climate and the environment and the planet into their processes. And what's kind of mind-boggling is that there's so much that already exists, but nobody's using it because the issue of the time and space that I talked about earlier in order to deploy them. Um, so again, what we're hoping with Design and Climate is to provide through the workshops that we're running the space to do that. And principally for people to take stuff away, try and apply it in the way that they can, and importantly, bring it back. So we're learning from each other, and you might be able to take a risk one day when I'm not able to, but at least I can learn from what you're trying. Um, ben at LiveWork has been thinking about this for years, as, as have others across the world. Um, there's also indigenous wisdom that um, we haven't even started to touch and learn from. Um, but like I said, we're still struggling to incorporate this. Um, and I think that goes for many designers that I'm kind of working, working with across the boards. Um, hence why the face-to-face -face meetings that we're planning and the workshops that we're running have been so integral to this community that we're building. Um, and in these workshops, what we're aiming to do is really adapt our practice to incorporate the environment in the now and in the long term. So Chris, that toolkit that you're kind of talking about, I hope we're actually starting to prototype here. Um, and it would be great uh, if you've got, any or anybody in this room is welcome to contribute to that. Um, because like I keep saying, it's pretty massive. Um, we're also working in the open to kind of create provenance for what we're learning and experimenting with. Um, this is a blog I wrote after the Climate Conversations workshop um, that I spoke about when I, when I began. And the idea is to just put this stuff in the open and let people use it and experiment with it and provide the space for people to report back on what they're doing. Um, and this is a big one. This was the one that really surprised me that kind of came out of uh, building this community was that people just simply don't have the confidence to talk about climate and eco the ecological crisis in their practice. So they're like, yeah, it's all very fine for uh, me to go and you know try and encourage a client, but I don't have the confidence to do that myself. So a lot of what the what a lot of what the community now is trying to build that confidence together, um, come up with some simple questions that we can ask. Uh, do we need enough data? Although now I would argue that kind of that data-driven approach isn't the right one, and to start actually with values. Um, but we're kind of experimenting and testing with this as well. Um, we're also co-designing ways to bring climate into our organization. So um, many of the organizations that have come and participated in design and climate, um, they don't have sustainability policies. Uh, they don't speak to their middle managers about this. Um, and so what can we crowdsource and do together to make those conversations easier? So we're slowly starting to turn every organization into one that's climate focused. Um, and we're also building stuff, um, um, like this remote workshop guide to cut carbon, which recently has turned into a save us from coronavirus guide, um, because more and more people are needing to do workshops remotely. 
um, which uh, has been really interesting to see. Um, and really what we're trying to do is work towards the radical um, because unfortunately that's the time and place that we're in now. We actually don't really have much time to um, fiddle and play, although that's exactly what we're championing and doing within design and climate. Um, because of the point going back to the conversations is that is actually where us as a design industry are at. And I think we just have to come to terms with that, acknowledge it, and then work really hard together um, and to, to address that. Um, if the climate crisis isn't coming up in your place of work in conversation with the clients and in the roadmaps you're building, then um, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, all of these resources, our learnings and workshops can be found on our new website. Um, now when I'm looking at this and looking at stuff, I'm thinking of Tom's and thinking we've got a little bit of work to do with our color scheme and things like that, <laughs> but that will come. Um, we're hoping to build this something into a little bit more robust as it gets populated um, and hopefully host it on a sustainable server. Um, and the invitation is op wide open to join us, which really means just sharing what you're learning and attempts to do this in which ever, whichever which way you can using the design and climate hashtag. Um, I'd really encourage you just to reflect on what you love about living on planet Earth um, and then get to work to make sure you have those conversations with everybody else along the way. Um, so that's me. Thank you so much, Lucy. And I uh, said so we really wanted to have Lucy this evening and, and kind of ending on that note because it is about working together. Um, do we have any questions for Lucy from the floor? Looking around. We're all stunned in silence, <laughs> reflecting the gentleman in the green hat. Hello. Thanks for that, Lucy, and a great initiative. Um, if, as a designer, what would be, if you had a magic wand, the tool that you would wish to make it easier to design more sustainably. Mm. So that might be uh, access to <laughs> information or um, a particular kind of program. What would be the tool that you would dream of? Uh, at the moment, I'm not sure it's a tool. It's more what I'm craving is case studies of which somebody has applied some a tool or some thinking. I have not, out of all of the tools that we've crowdsourced through our research, I've not used one of them. And I'm speaking very honestly about that because, like I said, until we find the time to incorporate those tools into our practice in a way that doesn't feel risky to the projects that we've been commissioned on, then we're stuck. So what I'm really hoping that Design and Climate will do quite quickly and pushing my own practice to maybe apply one of those tools, I don't know which one, there's so many, um, is then to have a case study to say, so-and-so did this, so let's do it ourselves, and then we get into that habit, which is very much what we're trying to do within um, the community, if that makes sense. I'm not, I'm not sure it's all about tools. I think it's, I think it's about co those conversations as well, so being able to speak to, uh, speak to a CEO and say, well, you know, what does this service that we're designing mean in 10 years when we've reached X planetary boundary and you know, what does that actually mean? Should we be designing this at all? Um, and I think maybe that is a tool. Uh, that question to me is probably one of my preferred tools to use. The applicable, my ability to, uh, my ability to apply that at the moment is what I'm really scratching my head about and trying to <coughs> circumnavigate within this community, if that makes sense. But have a look at the, go to our website and look at the Trello board and you will find loads of tools and I think the point that I'm trying to get at is that nobody's using them. And if they are, they're not necessarily sharing how. And then that doesn't make it necessarily better for the rest of us. Just not a great answer, but <laughs> <laughs> felt like I skirted that one. <laughs> Amazing. Any other questions? Yeah, from Chris. You just get a mic around to the front. Yeah, yeah. To the mic. Hey, Lucy. Hi. Great presentation. Um, <laughs> is there anyone? Um, you know, kind of as you're in your network or as you're looking around at other design teams or design agencies, any, anyone you think does this well? You know, so did you look at anybody and go, whoa, they've, you know, they're on the right track? Um, I think there are snippets of agencies doing really good projects. Um, I think Standby is doing some really interesting work. Um, I... 
there's an organization whose name I'm forgetting in Barcelona, but I'm happy to send it to you. They're doing some really interesting work. And it's like more individuals than I would say organizations. And I think what's interesting, I, I, I don't think we've necessarily sold in the way that you talked about design, which I really appreciate you saying. I don't think we've sold the facilitation aspect of our work very well to the world, which makes people think that we just make stuff. But actually, more principally, I think our role is that bringing everybody together to make stuff better in the, co in the right context in which we're doing it. And I, I think as an industry, we've, we've missold ourselves a little bit there. Um, which has potentially put us in a place where people don't look to us when it's like, oh, there's a sustainability or a, a climate catastrophe. And I think I'm part of this is trying to level up the design industry to say, like, actually, we're, we have a lot to offer here. Um, and I don't, think, uh, I don't think we're necessarily being acknowledged that way. But there's some very, very interesting projects. I mean, LiveWorks has done some interesting stuff. Like, I've worked with fishermen. Um, and we've done community berry growing schemes in Dundee. Like there are these interesting pockets, but I think I'm hoping again, design and climate can weave those together into a more coherent narrative to say, this is the role of design in shaping a sustainable future. Cause I'm just not sure that we're, I'm just not sure that we're good enough yet as an industry. <coughs> Worry. Okay. Let's go being critical. Right, cool. <laughs> um, I just want to invite Joe up as well, because I know you're working together, and just to give a, a shout out about um, an upcoming event that um, we're all invited to. Thank you. Thanks. I'll this get is off fun. the stage. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, I'm not on the billing, um, but I'm going to steal a little bit of your time. I think I've got a minute, so I'm yeah, going to be really quickly. Yeah. Uh, I'm Joseph, I'm a service designer at FutureGov. Um, I'm also part of the design and climate community. You might have noticed when Lucy was eight, she was wearing the Future Gov colors and their signature <laughs> chevron, so that will really annoy her, which makes me very happy. Uh, this is the worst possible time to announce an event because of the coronavirus, but please come anyway. We can make it as safe as we possibly can. As you can see on screen, Ultra Mega Jam is an event that's coming up. Um, the second one running is going to be Friday the 3rd to Sunday the 5th of April. I'm going to be really quick and just go through the who, what, when, where, why of that event and hopefully convince some of you guys to come along and make a difference. So as I say, I'm Joseph. I'm a service designer at FutureGov. We've just got Sophie over there, who's a practical person who actually makes things happen, which is really exciting. <laughs> we have someone else from called George, who can't be here tonight, who's from Sutherland Labs, who actually hosts us. What is it? It is Ultra Mega Jam. It's a design jam focused on creating space to think about solving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Hopefully you guys know what those are. If they don't, then go and look at them, because it's all very important to do with what we're doing this evening. Uh, it's set at all levels, and it's supposed to be as inclusive as possible. We all get in a room, we drink some beer, and then we try and work out what the hell we can do about all this stuff. It's supposed to be as fun as possible. The first one, so the second one, first one went very well. There's some pictures there which have blurred on transfer. Uh, they're not pixelated for identity reasons. Um, <laughs> what happened there? Did you not show that? <laughs> Saving energy. Yeah, we blurred the edges. <laughs> we blurred all of it. Um, yeah, it's going to be Friday, April 3rd, kicking off in the evening, and it goes on until Sunday the 5th, come down. Uh, it is in Southern Labs in Covent Garden, which up until tonight was the swishiest venue I've ever stood at the front of. But this is like definitely that now. <laughs> um, why are we doing it? I've got a sense from the evening tonight that people are frustrated that they can't actualize the stuff that we talk about here when we do our thinking at their places of work. We like to think of Ultra Mega Jam as the playing to DNC's doing, which is to the thinking that we all do tonight. There's lots of space there for designers to work out the big ideas that they can't just jam into their day-to-day -day lives, that they can't just talk to a client and say, we're going to try this crazy thing, because they say, no, we're not paying for that. But at Ultra Mega Jam, we say, yeah, do that. That sounds good. You've got the weekend. Have a beer. <laughs> also, the world might be ending. You all know that. This seems like one way to appropriate that. Not appropriate. Approach that uh, and do something exciting. <laughs> there is an Instagram tag there. There's a Twitter tag. Please follow us. The event is going to be announced properly at the end of this week. Um, but come down and try and make a difference to saving the world. Oh, thank you. Amazing. <laughs> Um, I'm thinking back to Chris. Do you have a quick answer for us, or no, shall we? We'll leave it. You can post a blog, and we can share. Get get writing. Get on the keyboard, and we'll we'll share it out afterwards. Um, can we just say a big thank you to Lucy as well, because I didn't give her a clap before. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. 
Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Um, the cameras have been on, and we're hoping to get tonight's talks um, up on YouTube, so you can recap. And if you didn't catch anything on your notes, um, then you can look back and, and reflect on, on this evening. Um, I'll also email out um, a link with those details, but also just asking your feedback. Um, if you can, let us know what you thought. The data is really important to us and helps us to keep running events. Um, last time we sent out our feedback, I think about four people told us. There's only like five questions, um, so if you could help us out um, and just fill that out, it, it won't take very long. Um, but that really helps us with running events. Um, and thanks everyone for coming. Hope you have a safe journey home. Um, stay well, stay healthy. Um, thanks very much.